I found some lectures on the Koopman operators that you mentioned last. Uh, I know Branton is good, so maybe I haven't read that. I, I'm mostly just trying to understand like where it applies in the work that I'm doing in general. Great proponent of Koopman formulation, but lots of people work with that you know, person who is really one of the leading one is called Igor Message. And I will find, so now it's the paper. And I think that's the paper. Okay, so the reason why it's called Kuplanism because both Mezic and Budishic, they come from Croatia, which used to be a part of a communist Yugoslavia and everything was called ism, like communism, and a dogmatic religion. So this is their religion, they call it Kupmanism. But because the uh, Mezic is a mathematician, but applied mathematician and he, works, it's, he was both at Santa Barbara and Harvard, but uh, in both cases, he works in mechanics department. So formally, he is an engineer, hi Han. And, uh, you know, so the emphasis in engineering department is on application. So this is a reasonable mathematical paper, if that's the correct paper I'm showing you because it has definitions and theorems in it, but its thrust is to uh, apply this formalism to fluid dynamics problems typically. So the way Message visualizes what's different between him and Chaos book, I, I represent geometrical scene, Poincare's geometric picture. That's what we developed in Chaos book. And uh, he thinks of himself and Koopman picture is a complementary to uh, the geometric picture. So geometric picture is that dynamics is a state space of states plus a law which tells you how they evolve in time. And uh, Poincare vision is what we, do all the time here in this book is say, well, the evolution in time means that all the points in the space move on the trajectories if they go for finite time or orbits if they go for infinite time, you know, on periodic solutions. And then, uh, you know, that's how the thing works. And in details, uh, one has, Heron Frobenius operator, which takes a density of states on state space and evolves every point uh, to a new density. And that is a very convenient formulation of the Poincare vision of dynamics because uh, you pay a price because the state space is infinite. So you have to look work on an infinite dimensional function space or when we discretize it, vector space. But what you gain is that operation of dynamics can be visualized, you know, can be thought of as a operator, linear operator or a matrix when you discretize. And that's what our Perron Frobenius is. Now that's a very powerful uh, way of thinking about nonlinear problems because you trade in the non-linearity of equations of motion for each trajectory by linearity of this operator. And you can now, whenever you have linear operators or matrices, you have powerful tools. The first powerful tool is that they have eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and eigenspaces. So that, uh, you know, the big problem can be has a natural coordinates to it that come from eigenvectors. Second, whenever you have some symmetry, these spaces can then, because uh, symmetry means 
the law commutes with symmetry transformations. And what symmetry transformation does is they block diagonalize the space, let's say, into symmetric or anti-symmetric or whatever, you know, or Fourier modes and many other things. So that's you know what message calls Poincare picture. Now uh, what this paper and you know all of his work, many, many papers in his career cover is the alternative framework where you don't look at all possible states, but you think about what is it that you're really observing? You know, what do you get out of this? And uh, to me, it looks like a formal detail, for, but for him is a very big deal. And, uh, you know, whenever you have a matrix, it has right eigenvectors and it has left eigenvectors. And left eigenvectors are the eigenvectors of the transpose of the matrix. So for me, talking about Perron Frobenius or evolution operator or the Koopman operator to me just looks like either I'm looking at a matrix or it's transpose. And you know, the eigenvectors are different for the matrix in general, unless matrix is symmetric, right and left eigenvectors are different. And you know, that they have different virtues. But he thinks of it differently. He says, um, uh, maybe let's see where, you know, this dynamics of observables. So he thinks that uh, this is a good way of capturing full nonlinear dynamics. And then, you know, they show that sometimes, and there is a chapter in Chaos book that tries to do it on Koopman operators. They show that uh, you can use this coupon operation to have not only local linear picture, that's what we do when we compute these Jacobians, they're just linearizations like this uh, orbit Jacobian means determinant, orbit Jacobian is linear. But they feel that, you know, if you choose your uh, world of observables, this uh, observables here, if you choose it, uh, intelligently, you actually capture the information that goes beyond just what happens linearly, captures the non-linear non, non parts of dynamics. And in the Chaos book, if you read the chapter, we have a couple of very simple examples of that. Uh, so he thinks that this is very applicable and, you know, they're in industry, so there are lots of people who do it and they show lots of applications. Brampton is one of the lectures we're reading now. Yeah, by Brampton and Kutz, Kutz uh, part of that picture. And, um, and what they say is that this eigenvector of Koopman operator, which for me are left eigenvectors opposed to right eigenvectors, uh, are generalization, you know, so they say Koopman modes uh, are better than just linearizations. And uh, so that's kind of their selling point. I think that's fair to say. And now this paper, I think is a pedagogical overview. So let me just get to four minutes. So it's a mathemat, you know, he's a mathematician, so you have to get used to his knowledge. But you know, uh, he says, as Kyle's book says, you know, dynamical system is a state base, this M, and the law, uh, and he will mostly study discrete time. So discrete time map T which is the law that tells you how you evolve in one step in time. And then something I try to avoid, but uh, mathematicians uh, feel the need to 
do this. Uh, when you talk about a system, you also have to describe, you know, how do you describe probabilities or densities of trajectories on small open subset in state space? And that's called sigma algebra uh, or measurables. And, you know, I try not to do it, but basically the main thing in the Gordic theory that it's an invariant measure, there are actually many of them. And they have a property that if you have this invariant measure, when you apply your time evolution on a subset, the invariant measure doesn't change. In other words, uh, the invariant measure is the eigenvector of, uh, of the evolution operator. So it doesn't change in the evolution. So that's a voodoo which I try to avoid. And, uh, you know, this is the usual map from a state to state later. Now, in control theory, you also, you know, have other functions on the state, uh, which you use to, you know, the desired results of the second uh, formula is always in the control theory. So now here is what I told you originally. You can, when you have you know, any function, it'll be called observable. You can evaluate that function by starting on the initial state space and advancing in time t. So that's the right hand of this equation. So it just says that I started someplace I moved everything for three minutes and now I stack my th thermometer. So F is a thermometer if you wish. And I me measure the temperature at a uh, you know, point in a state space. Now what the Koopman operator says as well, you know, T that is it's dual, it's a uh, transpose matrix. So what I can do is I can actually act on the, my observable with this matrix and measure what happens at state points. So it looks like something, but this is really just a transposition. And it's easier to understand, but he doesn't write it this way. When you write probability as integral, you know, expectation that is integral, then you see this very easily. So that's the only, you know, so. The chaos book studies T uh, and action, you know, law acting, well, measuring something that's changed on a state space. And this thing studies uh, the, you know, it's transports dual, et cetera, which is obvious when you write those matrices where you don't move in space, but you change the observable using this function. Now, in chaos book, and we'll typically take one observable, but if you're doing weather, you know, then you have to measure temperature 1,000 places, you have to measure pressure, and you have to measure, you know, the maybe atmospheric winds, and, you know, so you actually, probe the system with very many observables. So the issue is the following, you know, originally we defined the space on the state space and that, you know, every point was a different state. And if you specify all the points and the action of the law on them, that was a complete description of dynamics. And the crucial in that is that you know, if the state space was seven dimensional, then we had to have seven dimensional vectors uh, to give full specification. You know, having three dimensional vectors wasn't very useful because that's partial specification and we wouldn't be able to predict anything. So our law works only when you have a completely fully specified states. For example, if we have, you know, three, one sun and two planets, we have to specify 
six uh, positions and velocities for each one of them. And that's in that case, phase space of the system. And if you just gave me just one you know, position in X coordinate, it would be useless because my law would not be able to evolve it. Now, now we have the option of looking at lots of these functions, observables. See? So there is a space of the observables. So, and yeah. Let me see if I can understand heuristically equation three. So it, it's saying that F is our observable, let's, let's call it temperature. Um, and then T is our evolution operator p are the initial points so um if we apply our i assume t is our discrete mapping here so we apply t to our discrete mapping on the, our initial points we check to see what the temperature is after one iteration of our map t that's that's the right hand side of three right yeah so now the crudest way to understand it let's say that you know t is uh, two by two matrix. I mean, it's a nonlinear thing, but it's two by two function, right? So, and uh, let's say that F is just uh, a vector, you know, position X and position Y or temperature, etc. So you can think of this that the right hand side you're multiplying a vector times a matrix, and you can write that as a transpose of a matrix acting on F transpose again. So, you know, you can move, if these are just matrices and vectors, you can move this uh, T and replace it. You know, now it's acting on the vector, vector from the right, but you can write it as a matrix, which is a transpose of that matrix acting on it from the left, and that's what the left hand side is doing. I know it helps, but so we're looking you know, at that's this. that's just, that's just generalization to operator rather than matrices. So we're thinking writing the right hand side something like F transpose, and then T is a matrix evaluated at points P. Yeah. Okay, and then okay, okay. So, you know, it looks, well, you have to be careful because, but, you know, if you discretize it, it looks at a simple example, you can see where it comes from. So basically it's uh, in quantum mechanics, it's called difference between Heisenberg and Schrodinger picture or something. You know, you can either change your observables, you can evolve them, that's called Heisenberg picture. Or you can change your wave function, which is your state in a, uh, in quantum mechanics, you know, your state is a complex state in which you're evolving using a unitary evolution, which is generalization of a unitary matrix. So, uh, so that's what it says, you know. I have an equality in which either I, you know, look at the system time t later, or I evolve my measurement apparatus while well, system just sits there and I measure it with the you know time evolved apparatus that's the Koopman picture. So now uh, what we do is you know we take traces and determinants of these operators like this T you know that's that's what our spectral determinant is you know at least the linearization of this operators. And then, you know, when you're looking at traces and uh, it doesn't really matter whether you take a trace of a matrix or it's transpose, the trace is invariant on the transposition or determinant of matrix or it's transpose, it's invariant at that. So that's why in the approach of Keras book where you're basically looking at these traces, determinants, to do calculations, you know, I, I don't see a big advantage of thinking of it as Perron Frobenius or Koopman, you know, they, to me, they look the same. But the, this point of view is different. It says that actually 
you are shifting your point of view from looking on the state space to looking on the space of observables. Now, usually that's a huge reduction, you know, because if I just have one observable, like, you know, mean temperature in Europe, then uh, I do 10,000 measurements, that's my state space. I average all of them and they get one model. So that's what the theory is supposed to predict, but this is, you know, very small subset of what theory contains. The theory can do many other things, right? So, um, so now what message and maybe people before him, but you know, I'm understanding it best when he explains it, says, no, you know, if you have sufficiently many observables, you uh, actually might have all the information about theory that you need. You know, if you measure sufficiently many things. Now, why do, why do they think that? You know, why does message think about it? When you have dissipative systems, and that's not what Koopman, Koopman originally just copied uh, quantum mechanics and applied it to classical mechanics. So Koopman didn't think this way. But um, today, you know, if you have what we call inertial manifold or a strange attractor, that you can sometimes prove is a space that has finite dimension, whereas your state space is infinite dimension. Yeah. So the stuff that you're interested in for long or infinite time actually lives in a finite dimensional subspace. So it should be possible to span that finite dimensional subspace with some intelligent coordinate system of d dimensional. And uh, you know it can be linear coordinates for nonlinear system because you know an example of uh, this uh, inertial manifold for you it's a horseshoe that you get when you study asymptotics of a non map. You know the possible state is any point of the non map, but asymptotic states live in a, you know uh, one one plus small fraction uh, dimensional space, not in two dimensions, but just a little bit about one dimension. And that's what your horseshoe looks like. So, so these people say, well, you know, observables just measure the stuff on the horseshoe. That's what I'm interested in. And shouldn't I be able to redefine my dynamics? Now for a norm, it doesn't look like much because you're in two dimensions and to be able to see what happens on a small horseshoe is one plus a little bit more dimensions. So you need two dimensions to actually triangulate that. But if your system is in 10,000 dimensions, but inertial manifold is only three dimensions, then it looks like you know you might be able to use this observable that span the three important dimensions, and that's amazing reduction of the original problem. So that's kind of I think intellectual motivation to go to Koopmanism, which means the space de defined just by the things I can observe. For example, at infinite time, I cannot see the whole space. I only see my strange attractor, you know, smell horseshoe. That is uh, where all the orbits of the asymptotic system live. So, you know, so that's the basic, I think, the basic idea of Koopmanism. Mm 